Hey everybody, this is Roy Ripper and you're listening to HR Live Lounge podcast. It's the show exclusively for HR and talent acquisition leaders. And it talks about some of the biggest challenges that you're facing on your desks right now and explore some of the strategies that you could use possibly to overcome those challenges. Now, today we are talking about volume recruiting, big scale recruiting, with our very special guest, Stephen Rothberg. Stephen is the founder and chief visionary officer at job search site College Recruiter. Now, College Recruiter work with Fortune 1000 companies, government agencies, and a lot of other employers to hire at scale students and recent graduates for part-time, for seasonal, for internship and entry-level jobs. Now, a fact that I didn't know is every single year, college recruiter help more than 13 million young people globally find great new jobs. I think that's worth celebrating. In today's episode, we discuss everything that you need to know about volume recruiting. And I want you to stay tuned to the end to discover the biggest challenge that you're facing as a HR director or a talent acquisition leader. And in addition, learn exactly what you need to do or what you need to be doing right now to guarantee that you are going to win the battle for talent and not lose out to your competitors. So um, here's a little taste coming up for you of what you can expect on this episode. Sit there and think this little tiny company that I founded in 1991 on an annual basis is helping 13 million people find great new careers. It's a little mind boggling. Chat GPT is probably the easiest tool that is hitting you in the face is driven by AI. So yeah. If you are in HR and you are even unconsciously penalizing candidates for using chat GPT, you got to do a 180 real fast. It would be like in the 1950s and 60s saying, we don't want accountants using calculators. <laughs> what we really want them to use is paper and pen because that's how I grew up. I mean, it just, it's irrational. If it takes you 14 months to do what other organizations are doing in two weeks, Guess who's going to win that battle for talent? Yeah. Welcome to HR Live Lounge, where you get to meet with some of the most inspirational human resources leaders and talent acquisition specialists on the planet. And now, here's your host, Roy Ripper. Hello, and welcome to another episode of HR Live Lounge. I'm your host, Roy Ripper. And today I've got a really, really special guest for you. I'm going to introduce Stephen Rothberg. I need to make sure I get that right. Stephen Rothberg. Stephen's here and welcome, Stephen. Roy, it is awesome to be with you. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Fantastic. So Stephen, look, let's just kick off. Tell our, our listeners, our viewers, something about yourself. It's like, what are you doing now? What about your previous background? Tell us a bit about you. Yeah. So what I'm doing now and have been for, for years is I am the founder and chief visionary officer of College Recruiter. It's a job search site. We believe that every student and recent graduate deserves a great career um, and that it should be easy and inexpensive for employers to hire them. Uh, a little over a year ago, we went global um, and already about a third of our business is from outside the US. Um, um, I live in Minneapolis um, with my wife and my hyper-bonded dog, uh, hyper-bonded thankfully to me. We have um, three adult kids, one who also lives in Minneapolis, another near Penn, Philadelphia, and another in Montreal. I grew up in Winnipeg, Canada, and I like to say that I'm the only person in the history of Minnesota to have moved here for the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I, I know the, the the work that you guys do at College Recruiter is immense, yeah. and I think when we've spoken previously, I've talked about you know my four kids and and uh, of the age they are. One's at uni, one's at college, one's just about to go to college, and the other one is going about to go to college. 
I, I think you're doing fantastic work. How do these young people engage with college recruiter? How do you sure. find them? How do you get them to you? Yeah, yeah, no problem. So, you know, I think as you and I were talking, you're just slightly behind um, where we are because our youngest is 24. The, the way that students and recent graduates of colleges or universities, kind of that zero to five years of experience audience find us right. is very much the same way as any other job search site, whether it's an Indeed, you know, in the UK, you know, there, there are a number of sites, you know, like Reed, for example, most of the job boards in the world are somewhat general. They have yeah. all different kinds of jobs requiring all different kinds of years of experience. Yeah. And they focus on a particular geographic niche, right? Yeah. So you might have a stepstone in Germany that is really primarily focused on Germany. There's going to be another or other sites in Malaysia, Australia, et cetera. Sure. There are also niche sites like College Recruiter that target candidates not so much geographically, but maybe by industry, so engineering jobs, or in our case, kind of by education. So okay. when a student or recent grad is searching for a job, one of the things that surprises people of our generation is that they do it the same way that we do. Yeah. There's this site, you've probably heard of it, um, called Google. And they tend to go to Google like we all do, no matter what it is that we're searching for, whether yeah. it's a new razor or a hammer or a restaurant meal or a job. It yeah. tends to be our first point. And yeah. so they'll search for a job on Google. They might go to College Recruiter. They might go to another job search site. Um, so we partner with about 120 other job sites around the world. And also a couple of hundred colleges and universities um, run our job posting. So what we try to do is get the right opportunity in front of the right candidate at the right time. That might mean that they're on our site where they're very actively looking. It might mean that they're on LinkedIn trying to figure out, you know, how to network or see who they know at a particular company. It might mean that they're on their university's career service office site and running a, running a search. Okay. It's actually fairly common. Job search sites, we are a very incestuous industry. Um, okay. Almost everybody knows everybody. Almost everybody does business with everybody. Um, and there's this word coopetition that is very prevailing in our industry. I love that. I love that. Stephen, you've been around mm -hmm. the people space for a number of years, probably more mm -hmm. than you and I would want to admit on camera how long we've been in it. So um, the business started November 1991, so 32 wow. years ago for those wow. who, uh, who don't uh, do math well, uh, which is a long time. Me. And um, we launched our website, uh, what later became collegerecruiter.com. We launched that in 1996. So Fantastic. Yahoo had just gone live and Google was two years away from okay. going live. So that's also been a long time. And the world has changed so much, isn't it? I just, I yeah. always uh, amaze myself that you and I come from a generation where we didn't have these things. Now it's yeah. kind of accepted as it's life and my kids are completely bilingual in that language it's a crazy development that we've had crazy advances most of them positive some of them not so positive so look Stephen I, I'm really keen to get you to share a memorable moment mm. from that past career that taught you an important lesson or it had a significant impact on your approach to talent acquisition and finding people yeah I I, I love this question and and I have a good one to share with you. Please so do. when I was in law school, um, it's it's three years, um, my second and third year, and then also the summer when I was studying for the for the bar exam, um, mm -hmm. I worked for one of the largest companies in the world, um, Honeywell. Uh, when I joined Honeywell, there were about eighty thousand employees. By the time I left, about two and a half years later, there were 50,000. And it wasn't because of layoffs. It was because of di divestitures. We were spinning right. off companies. When the, the company had kind of really grown in like the 50s, 60s, 70s, conglomerate right. time. 
And the theory back then was that you should diversify your businesses. And then these things called mutual funds came along. Shareholders no longer needed the company to diversify their investment. They could do that on their own. So sure. conglomerates kind of fell out of favor um, in the 90s uh, or the 80s, 90s. And that's basically the time that, that I was at Honeywell. One of the things that was really great about working there, and there were a lot of great things um, in that about that environment, is I had two of the best bosses that anybody could ever hope for. Right. The first boss that I had was a guy named Sam Rea. And then, and then the second year that I was there, I basically did the same kind of job working as a law clerk, like an assistant to another lawyer, to Sam's boss. And sure. Sam's boss was this guy named Marv Granith. Okay. Marv was a senior vice president in the company. His boss was the CEO. So I was wow. really low on the totem pole. I was really young, 20. 425. But because my boss reported to the CEO, I got exposure to a whole lot of things that yeah. somebody that junior usually doesn't. Yeah. And Marv was a fantastic boss and mentor. And he was always really happy to share to prepare me for meetings that we were going to be in. And so one of those meetings that I had been involved in doing some legal research on involved an employee at a manufacturing facility in Phoenix, Arizona, through no fault of the employee. It was just, a, it was a terrible industrial accident and he lost an arm. Oh my goodness. One of the weird things for most people in the US, not in the US, when they look at, at our, the way we deliver healthcare or insure people yeah. in the US is it's mostly private. Yeah, Most people get their health insurance through their companies. Right. And as a result, the coverage that one person gets from one company is going to be different than what a very similar person would from another company that's very similar. You wow. might have coverage for one thing and somebody else might have not have that same coverage. So our healthcare plan, for whatever reason, did not address what would happen healthcare-wise in the event that somebody lost a limb. So certainly we covered the cost of, you know, cleaning the wound and stitching them up and, you know, and all of that kind of stuff, right. but not the prosthetic. Wow. It didn't say that we did. And it didn't say that we didn't. It, didn't. it was just silent. Nobody had right. ever thought of it is right. really what it boiled down to. Sure. So the employee files a claim or submits some paperwork to his manager in Phoenix. And right. the manager says, absolutely, we're going to cover the cost of your arm. It was a few thousand dollars. Right. It's like, how could we not do that? But exactly. the manager didn't check with the person who was responsible for that language, which was me. Right. And Ouch. so he just went ahead and wrote a check. Now, the okay. problem with that is if you cover one healthcare expense for one employee, then because of non-discrimination rules, you have to cover it for all employees. Sure. So my boss, Marv, and I are walking to this meeting and we're talking about the eight or whatever different things that are going to come up in this meeting. And one of them is this. And I briefed right. him on what the situation was. And it's like, fine, thanks. I was so low. I was one of those people who didn't sit at the table. I sat at a chair along the wall away right. from the table. So okay. if I was needed, I would be called on, which rarely was I needed. Um we're having this meeting and the CEO of the company, Jim Renier, did what Jim often did, which was just pop into random meetings. Right. He liked to have a pulse, which I also right. think is fantastic. Yeah. He walked in. So what are we doing here today? And we were right, coincidentally, right in the midst of talking about my issue, this, this employee with the prosthetic. So he listens to the situation and he kind of pauses and gets this very thoughtful look on his face. He was an engineer. He was a very thoughtful, serious person. And he said... Does anybody here think that we should not be covering the cost of a prosthetic for an employee who is hurt in one of our manufacturing facilities? Wow. And everybody's silent. And he said, so are we done? Yeah. And people said, done. yep. And we you know, kind of closed up our binders or whatever, and the meeting was done. Right. The lesson to me that was really powerful yeah. Is that just because you as an employer can do something, yeah. deny that coverage, does not mean that you should, should. do that. Yeah. That 
you can you can fill in gaps yeah. in your rules to deal with unanticipated situations and you can even break your rules even yeah. if the healthcare plan had said we will not cover this we could have chosen to cover it it just, just meant that we would cover it for everybody well, yeah. what would be wrong with that exactly and i think i think that there's a tendency amongst some hr people not all probably not most right to be too rule bound rigid rules are meant to make things better yeah and sometimes there are unintended consequences of rules yeah. and you realize you need to have an exception or sometimes just get rid of the rule altogether yeah and that was a fantastic example for me where every single person involved including the employee his manager, the leadership, you know, somebody low in the totem pole who just got a file dropped on his desk like me, everybody was in agreement. This yeah. is the right thing to do. And we did it. And it is that thing of do the right thing, isn't it? It's, it you know, yeah. almost that's the, that's the law. It doesn't matter what the rules are. It doesn't matter what the legals are. It's like, just do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, I love that anecdote. And, and, and thanks for sharing that. What I wanted to ask you is in today's competitive market, Attracting and keeping, retaining top talent yeah. is a, such a common challenge. It's like I hear this from everybody that I speak to, human resource directors, CHROs. They're saying, look, you know, finding them uh, and hiring them and then keeping them is like huge for them. So yeah. what innovative approaches or benefits have you introduced to make your organization or your clients organizations more attractive to potential candidates yeah yeah so we sit college recruiters sits at sort of at the intersection of a, of a of a three three different niches if you will education high volume hiring because the reality is the vast majority of college and university students go to work for large companies right with that are hiring dozens hundreds sometimes thousands a year Wow. Um, and, and then also the early careers, right? Some high volume hiring is done with people at, of all different levels of experience. Truck drivers okay. would right. be a good example of that. Um, sometimes nurses and in, in, in hospitals or healthcare systems would be an sure. example of that. Sure. Um, because we sit at that intersection, volume matters greatly. Right. And one of the things traditional pricing models for just about any kind of media, print, broadcast, online, whatever, yeah. is CPM, cost per thousand. So if you yeah. buy an ad in a magazine or a newspaper or a billboard or on TV, basically what you're paying is for eyeballs, oh, the see. number of people who will see your ad or who are likely to sure. see your ad. And sure. there's no promise that that's how many, but it's kind of an approximate. This is yeah. our audience. This is about how many people you should reach. So way back when, 10, 20 years ago, when say Monster Career Builder were the dominant players, you would pay more for a 30 day job posting ad on Monster than you would on most other sites because Monster had a lot more traffic. Right. And that made sense. Yeah. In 2000, 2001, Google popularized pay-per-click advertising. So over two decades ago, that is wow. now That's just awesome. reaching most markets in the world in the job board world. It's yeah. been very popular in the US for the last five, six years. Sure. It's now popular in the UK. It's becoming popular in Europe. One of the real be beautiful things about pay-per-click advertising is that if you have a high volume hiring need, you can buy more clicks. Yeah. If you have a very low volume need, like one person, you can buy less. Yeah. So some employers that are adjusting to this new world of performance-based pricing are uncomfortable. They think that what it is, it's, a, it's an effort by the job board to extract more money. Right. But what it really is, is it's, a, it's an effort by the job board to align your results with your needs. Yeah. If you need to hire 200 people, you need 200 times the clicks to your website, the 200 times the applications, 200 times the interviews exactly. as an employer hiring this for the same role, but only one person. Yes. So what pay-per-click advertising does, and we're a leader in this, is 
if you only need to hire one person, we might send 50 people to your career site, Right. probably five or 10 of them will apply and you'll probably yeah. hire the person you need to. So yeah. you don't get overwhelmed with quantity, yeah. which employers quite correctly have long complained about. I yeah. post a job to Monster, I get 2000 applications. The reason you got 2000 applications is that Monster had no way of differentiating 20 years ago. Yeah whether you're looking to hire one person or 200. And so they would deliver the same volume. They, they would be no turning it off. Yeah, right. Employers also could have logged in at any time to those job boards once they had received enough applications and inactivated their posting. Yeah. But a lot of them prefer to complain rather than do that. Yeah. And so that's on the employer. That's not on the job board. So one of the, I wouldn't call it an innovation because we certainly didn't, create it or innovate sure. it, but we definitely are riding that that trend, that wave, and that is performance-based pricing. So we are really, really good at helping employers advertise their jobs on a pay-per-click basis. That's similar or not similar, complementary yeah. to programmatic. Programmatic is just automated job distribution rather than a, a recruiter or um, an employment branding person deciding where to run the employer's ads for how long, how much to pay for it. Instead, the computer does that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that can be pay-per-click or it can be duration-based, but we do a lot of that. So one of the things that we're seeing is the UK is rapidly catching up to the US in pay, pay for performance right. and programmatic. Right. And the EU is... It's not rapidly catching up to the UK, but I, in two years, it's going to be hard to differentiate it. Uh, yeah. the, it, it. It sort of reached a tipping point last summer, and now it's becoming widely accepted there. That's, and, and, and listen, thank you for that. I, I, I'm, I'm old enough, Stephen, to remember in the good old days of recruitment, um, we were placing um, print, print media, print mm -hmm. ads, job advertising. And I remember then the way that the the media used to sell themselves were on their distribution their distribution numbers and their right. readership numbers, and it was just a vanity thing. It'd be like, well, we've got thirty thousand people that subscribe to the magazine, mm -hmm. but I'd place my job in there, you know, almost guaranteed. People would be on holiday. They wouldn't read that subscription. They wouldn't yeah. be looking, for, you know, in the classifieds. That when they got into the classifieds, my ad might not look looked attractive. It was so seat of your pants. You know, does the ad yeah. is the ad going to work? It was prey, right? And from what you've described, and, and and you guys were early adopters of 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 that innovation. Yeah. You can really target down. So if you only want to speak to a certain demographic. Yes. In a certain geographical area, you know, you're, you're, the, the way that you're doing it seems like the far smarter way. And it's it, it, it sounds like the more cost effective way as well. You know, it doesn't matter if I get cheap ads somewhere else. The quality of the response that you're getting is going to be uh, far, far greater, I would imagine. Yeah, it, it shifts the risk of the ad not working yeah. from the employer to yeah. the media. And a word yeah. that you used a minute ago is really key, pray. Yeah. So you've probably heard the phrase post and pray. Right, exactly. Post and pray is because you post your job, you pay your 200 or 300 pounds, euros, dollars, you know, wherever you are geographically. Sure. And you pray that you're going to get results. Yeah. Well, wouldn't you rather pay if you got results? Now, yeah. employees, Employers, and I know that there are going to be a bunch who are probably thinking this right now, you know, watching or listening to this saying, sure. well, a click to my website is not a result. Yep. Well, the, it true. You're yeah. absolutely right. But it's better than somebody going to a job board mm. and not even seeing your ad. Exactly. Or somebody going to the job board and seeing your ad, but choosing not to take any action. At least yeah. they've taken some action if it's a click. Yeah. You can also pay per application. That's becoming increasingly common. Not as yeah. not as common as click, but applicate a completed application. Right. That's becoming more common. And I think that within a few years, the standard is in in industrialized countries is going to be pay per quality. 
application. Nice. And the quality being determined by the employer within a certain number of days, probably something like three business days, choosing to take action, moving a candidate forward. The forward depends on the employer. Some employers yeah. like Amazon for warehouse positions, there are no interviews. Instead, wow. you go to an assessment. And if you pass the assessment, they tell you to show up Tuesday at 9 a.m or whatever wow. your shift that you select. So they've eliminated interviewing for warehouse positions. Some employers, the vast majority, still do interviews. Yeah. But it might just be a phone interview. Yeah. 10 minutes, let's jump on. You can talk to me. I can talk to you. And let's see if it's worth a hiring manager spending an hour with you, That's right? Great. That moving forward, the I received your application. I'm going to offer you a yeah. phone interview, yeah. that means that a recruiter or somebody in that role has reviewed the application and has decided that you meet their minimum level of quality, a desired yeah. level of quality. And if that's the case, the media, the job board has done its job because yeah. we can deliver the candidate to you and we should be delivering candidates to you that meet your minimum level of qualifications. Yeah. But after that, it's all on you and you should want that. You don't yeah. want the job board telling you who to hire and who not to hire. No. You know better than the job board does what makes for a good candidate in your the environment. The selection is up to the employer, isn't it? All of, uh, yep. you know, the job board is doing is like, let's get eyes, but let's get quality eyes on it. Yes. But really it's it's the client's interview process, selection process, and the speed that they can do that in. That, that that really counts. I, I'm I'm thank you for that, Stephen, and and particularly sure. that Amazon thing. I hadn't even thought about that before. That you know, just not putting that barrier of or delay in their their hiring process of an interview means yeah. that they can just get people through the door, and that works at these volume these volume sort of hiring patterns yes. that they they need to go through. I'm really keen to find out from you, Stephen. What's the biggest challenge? that you or your clients are facing right now and yeah. how are you going about tackling it? How are you going about helping your people? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And, and I think if you were to have asked me six months ago, 18 months ago, three years ago, you know, two years from now, the answer is going to be different. I think it, when when I think of the greatest challenge that that we have right now, I think it is the same challenge that the vast majority of people in talent acquisition have. Right. And along with the related industries, we live in very uncertain times. Yeah. There are loads of times in Canadian history, America's history, the UK, whatever, where things are pretty stable. Yeah. And sure, you know, there could be something big that happens next week, but we don't expect it. Yeah. We don't expect massive change to happen at any moment. Yeah. In in the times that we live in, just you know, over the last few months, the hottest topic has been AI, yeah, which is going to fundamentally change the way that all work is done. And it's mm -hmm. going to do it faster than any technological change in human history. True. And we're right in the middle of that. So when people are feeling really uncertain about, do I have a job? Mm -hmm. What does that job look like a year from now? Am I going to be on the street because AI is going to be doing my work? Or am yeah. I going to be able to do work that I've always wanted to do because AI will free me from the mundane stuff, right? right? Great questions. Who the heck knows? We just don't know. So the uncertainty is that's the keep me up at night. Yeah. That's the biggest area of, of uncertainty. I mean, just, you know, just this week, you know, yesterday, you know, the president of the United States was indicted for attempting to overthrow his own government. Yeah. You can't tell me that we don't live in uncertain times. This yeah. is this is not the norm. And it's so planning is really hard. If if I can go on on a slight tangent here. Please. In the world of college and university recruiting, whether we're talking EU, UK, Australia, Canada, US, whatever. Industrialized countries around the world, it looks remarkably similar. Usually in April or May, the big employers of students and recent grads are the Fortune 1000 companies, some of the government agencies. They get together in, you know, within the organization 
April and May, hiring managers, talent acquisition leaders, and decide how many people are we going to not want to have on board on board a year later, the, wow. the next May, June, July. Right. So 13, 14 Forward months money. later. Right. Right. How many people are we going to want to hire? What are their majors? Maybe there are certain schools, geographic issues. And so you're trying to plan that out 13, 14 months from now. I can't tell you what I'm going to have for dinner tonight, <laughs> let alone tell you, you know, these are the 400 people that we want to hire 13, 14 months from now. But the yeah. reason for the 13, 14 months is because once they have that plan, then they spend June and July contacting the college and university career service offices, right. arranging for on-campus visits, career fairs, et cetera. They go on campus September, October. They interview in what was formerly a broom closet. You often attach to the school library. They're extending an offer. And then basically they do their best to ignore that new hire for the next six, seven, eight months and are shocked when that person doesn't show up. Right. Um, that is how college and university hiring has been done since 1952. Always. Yeah. 70 always. years. It's been uh -huh. like that. And COVID has changed that. Yeah. COVID said, you know what? These people are online. Yeah. We might actually be able to reach a member of Gen Z slash Z through this thing called the internet. And so yep. now employers can shorten that time to hire. You mentioned speed earlier. Yeah. Speed is critical. If you can, if you can define a need, advertise the role or source, you know, use sourcing get applications in, extend, you know, interview, extend offers. If you can do all of that within a couple of weeks, your likelihood of landing the right candidates in the right quantity at the right time go up astronomically. Yeah. But if it takes you 14 months to do what other organizations are doing in two weeks, guess who's going to win that battle for talent? Yeah. What happened to the dinosaurs, right? Um, it, yeah. It's smoking. It was yeah. it was smoking that that led to their demise. <laughs> it's interesting as well because you know one of the things that I used to you know sort of live my life as a recruiter by was fish where the fish are. It's like look, yeah. If, if Gen Z is completely au fait with living on phones and doing everything, conducting business, conducting their personal life, it's like you've got to go to where they are as opposed yeah. to where you think they should be, right? Yeah. You're not um, going to change that. You're not going to change them. So, you know, you, you can change to adapt to how your candidates want to want, uh -huh. want to interact with you or you can have no candidates. Yeah. The, exactly. You know, that's that's the choice. Exactly. I, you know, they, they were talking about the war of the war on talent, you know, sort of years ago, but, but really mm -hmm. this is it, if you're, you're in it. And the other interesting thing that I heard there is it, the, the world is so uncertain. It's like literally yeah. things are changing every single day. And so those companies that are trying to predict what's going to happen in 14 months time, it's like, who knows, you know, if there was another right. pandemic or whatever, it's like, who knows what's going to happen question well final question before i get into a quick round with you sure what's the biggest the number one thing that you love about the job that you do right now mm. the number one thing that i love about the job that i do is also the number one thing that i have to force myself to remember okay that we do <laughs> okay and that and i think I think that there are probably people in talent acquisition who probably share this, certainly in solution providers that support the TA role, like job boards, assessment companies, background checking, whatever. Sure. At the end of the day, what you're doing, what we're doing is helping people find great new careers. Yeah. Okay. And there is no higher honor than in helping somebody become self-sufficient. Yeah. And when we are operating on an hour to hour day to day basis, we being a college recruiter, yeah, we are overly focused on the amount of money that this employer is spending for this advertising campaign, yeah. how many candidates we delivered, what the number of applications that generated, what's the effective cost per application, what our gross profit on that was. Yeah. It's almost all numbers. Yeah. It's Data. very dehumanizing. Yeah. And it's not that we don't 
care about the candidate, but when we are, you know, when you're in the, in, when you're in the eye of the hurricane, you got to do, you, you got to stay alive exactly, and, and, and figure out kind of like what you need to do to um, make both customer groups happy, both the employers that are advertising their jobs and also the job seekers. Yeah. When we step back and we do this deliberately, we do this very overtly, we will talk about it internally. And I try to do this at least once a day and step back and say to myself, okay, yesterday, for example, um, we sent about 30,000 candidates to the career sites of our employer clients. Right. Okay. Now, not right. all 30,000 applied, but a number. we helped yesterday, 30,000 people advance their careers. Yeah. Um, just in a very significant way. These are not people who just happen to come to our site and read an article on how to write a resume, right? They they actually ran a job search. They actually found a job, one or more of interest to them. They yeah. actually clicked the apply button to go to the employer's site. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a pretty high level of activation. It's massive. And so last year in 2022, that totaled to about 13 million. To sit there and think this little tiny company that I founded in 1991 on an annual basis is helping 13 million people find great new careers, it's it's a little mind-boggling. I have That's, a hard time wrapping my head around that. You've, you've blown my mind with it, Stephen. And, and you yeah. know, so just to um, kind of echo what you say, I, I, I think it's not just influencing the careers of somebody and without sounding a little too cheesy, because I've used this myself and people go, oh, you know, it's a little bit cheesy. Uh, cheesy. You change people's lives. And yes. it's not just the candidates, not just those young people, that 13 million. But if you think about it on the reverse side, the clients that you place them with, the mm -hmm. teams and the departments uh, of people that, that take those young people in, it's like it affects everybody. The families and the friends of those young people, that 13 million that you've introduced, all of that positive ripples going out. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of zen in the job role that you that, that, that you occupy in the company that you've launched. So yeah, I'd be it, proud it, of that. Yeah, and you know, speaking to the choir here, but you know, if you're, if you're a recruiter, yeah. Um, you know, which we're not, but if you're a recruiter and you've got, you know, say 20 recs open at any given time, and you know, there may be open for, you know, a couple of months on average or something sure. like that. So, you know, over the course of a year, maybe you're can maybe you're helping to hire, you know, a hundred, two hundred people. You know, that would be pretty normal in a big organization. That's right. The impact that you are having on each of those people is way more significant than what our company does, right? Yeah. Our company kind of gets an ad in front and you know, here's an ad, click the apply, go to the employer site and apply. At sure. that point, that talent acquisition person, the recruiter, the hiring manager, they are spending way more time, they're yeah. way more involved, way more of the credit to yeah. hiring that person or finding that they're not the right person sure. goes, to the, goes to that team. So the fact that we help 13 million a year and a listener might help 200 a year yeah. is not to say that we're that much better. Yeah. In a lot of ways, what they're doing is more significant because they're having yeah. a way more significant impact on that person, their family, their friends, like you say, also their coworkers. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I, I, and I always love whenever I'm interviewing anybody, when I ask that question about what do you love about the job, you're an animated guy anyway, Stephen, but your face lit <laughs> up because uh, yeah. I could tell it's like, that's what he really loves. And that's brilliant. So, Stephen, look, I want to move us into the the quick round section of, of this show. So question number one, is there someone in the HR industry, human resources industry that you admire in terms of leadership or innovation that you'd like to give a shout out to? So somebody that probably some of your listeners know or know of, okay. but everybody should, Right, is a guy named Jim Durbin. D-U-R-B as in Bravo, I-N. Jim, Oops. I've known him for probably 20 years, been actually in person with him several times, shockingly wow. in this world, right? Jim used to, his, his, his nickname used to be that, I think it was like social 
media recruiter or, or yeah. headhunter or something like that. Yes. More recently, he's con- he's gone by calling himself the Indeed Whisperer. Oh. So he's kind of he's probably more knowledgeable about how to get the best ROI from Indeed yeah. of anybody in the world, including people at Indeed. He knows things about how Indeed works that most Indeed employees don't. Indeed's a wow. fairly big company, right? Very yeah. few people would have a handle on everything going everything. on. The thing that I love about Jim and that I would really encourage the the listeners to, to follow him on LinkedIn and to really sort of absorb the, yeah. the information, he's fantastic at sharing what he's learned yeah. in a very plain English, easily digestible, very readable manner. He's also probably the most data-driven person that I know of in talent acquisition. Yeah, He's never one of these guys who will say, well, this is what I do because I just think it's probably right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he will do things that he thinks are probably right. Right. But he's testing. Yeah. And the lessons that I learned from him about what actually works and what actually doesn't is awesome. So sorry about the long answer. As a fully recovered lawyer, I am paid by the word. (laughs) (laughs) And great, great answer. So uh, Stephen, we're coming to towards the end of our time together, but what's one question that you wish I'd asked you and how would you have answered that question? Yeah, I think the question that comes to mind for your audience would be if I'm in a small, medium, large employer, I'm in recruiting, part of my role is recruiting talent acquisition. What can I do to um, improve my skills, to make my job safer and better as AI is poised to, to upend everything? The biggest piece of advice in summary is embrace it. Learn how to use it. Chat GPT is probably the easiest tool that is like hitting you in the face is driven by AI. The yeah. reality is we've been we've been all using AI for years. When you go to exactly. Google and run a search for years, it's been driven by AI. You use Gmail and you see the autocomplete. Oh, I think this is the next word that you meant to type. That's been AI and we've had exactly. that for years. But that doesn't really change the way we work fundamentally. No. But tools like ChatGPT do. So yeah. if you are in HR and you are even unconsciously penalizing candidates for using ChatGPT, you got to do a 180 real fast. You should want those people in the workforce because those people are embracing the next generation of tools. They're making themselves more productive. It would be like in the 1950s and 60s saying, we don't want accountants using calculators. (laughs) What we really want them to use is paper and pen because that's how I grew up. And if they don't take more time and make more mistakes, I'm upset. Yeah. about that i mean it just it's just it's irrational it so really is. embrace it look for ways of using it in your own job multiple times a day look for ways of introducing it into your workplace and look for candidates who are already embracing it fantastic i wish i'd asked you that question and i love your answer uh, really to- <laughs> really topical for me as well i'll explain that on a on maybe on a later show Stephen, we are coming to the end and I really want to thank you for just sharing some great information, some great anecdotes and some real knowledge bombs as well. I, you know, really, really pleased that we got into this and I got to meet you. Final question. What's the best yeah. way for people to connect with you, to reach out to you, to sure. learn more about what the work that College Recruiter does? Yeah. You know, if 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 they want you know, obviously, you know, go to that place called LinkedIn. There are, I think, three Stephen Rothbergs, um, S-T-E-V-E-N-R-O-T-H-B-E-R-G, but I'm the only one that has linkedin.com slash I-N slash Stephen Rothberg because I was early enough. I I grabbed that from the guy from the guy in Australia. And I think that there's a lawyer in New Jersey with the same name. But anyway, that, or definitely shoot me an email, Stephen at collegerecruiter.com. Fantastic. Stephen, we'll put those links in the show notes as well, but thank you for that. Yeah, listen, great hanging out with you. I'm looking forward to finding out more about you when we get to meet next, whether that's in the UK, whether it's in Spain. At some stage, I know our paths are going to cross and I really look forward to that. 
If it's in the UK, I buy you a pint. And if it's in Spain, I buy you a paella. And a tapa and a nice, <laughs> a nice couple of tapas. <laughs> Stephen, great. Thank you so much. And we'll chat soon. Take care for now. Cheers, Ray. Thank you for listening to the HR Live Lounge podcast with your host, Roy Ripper. Be sure to visit royripper.com to join the conversation. Access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content.